Okay. Hey, thank you all for coming out. Uh, hey, we're going to go back to the original because Andre is here. Andre, you're going to be up first. Okay. <clears throat> um, cool. Well, thank you all for coming out to the Ember Meetup. Um, we are here uh, Thursday, July 25th. Uh, my name is Luke Melia. Uh, I'm the uh, co-founder of Yap and organizer of this meetup. Um, and i uh, excited to see you all out on a beautiful summer night. Um, I've got a few announcements, and I also will open up the floor uh, to announcements from any of you, uh, whether it's events, uh, if your your team's hiring, if you're looking for a number job, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to get into, we'll get into our talks. We've got three lightning talks today and our main talk um, from Alex Metchner um, on the Ember router, which I'm excited about. Um, and uh, first, some... Um, Good stuff that's been uh, that's online that's come out of this meetup. Um, our June events uh, video is up, and our um, the fireside chat with the Ember Core team uh, is video is up from that as well. Uh, please say thank you to uh, Lee Nussbaum, who's in the back here, Waverly. Uh, Lee has been is it uh, doing awesome work getting um, video quality video captured from these events and sharing it um, far beyond this room. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, for the speakers, please repeat the question. Do all the things that make videos enjoyable to watch for uh, folks who are not can't be here tonight. Um, anyway, this this was a, a great discussion um, with Yehuda Katz, Tom Dale, Chris Selden, Stefan Penner, um, and Leah Silber. Uh, and then uh, last month's meetup for the I know a few a few of our regulars missed last month. It was all about promises uh, in JavaScript in general, and then in Ember in particular. Uh, and that was an awesome one as well. Um, this one is a little self-plug. I gave a talk uh, a week and a half or ago or so, maybe longer, um, at Gotham JS. Uh, the title was Ember JS, the Architecture Advantage, talking about how Ember apps scale and as, as complexity grows, what Ember does to, um, to keep your application and your development process manageable as that happens. Um, so the slides are up on speaker deck. Um, video was captured. I know somebody was asking earlier. Uh, that's not been posted yet, but it, when it does, I'll make sure I tweet from the Ember NYC Twitter account and from uh, and from my own account. Um, a, a resource that has taken off over the last uh, two weeks is the podcast, The Ember Hot Seat. This has been put together by Devaris Brown, um, who works for Zendesk out in San Francisco. And he's been interviewing different members uh, of the Ember community, um, mostly you know people who have contributed or are contributing to the framework. Um, and there are they're great interviews. They're about a half an hour each. Uh, and he's been I, he cannot possibly keep up at the clip that he's at because he's been putting out like one a day. Um, but uh, definitely, if you want to get a, a sense, kind of besides the specific tech the technology of Ember, if you want to just get a sense of the community and how things work, um, definitely pop that onto your iPod, iPhone. Um, okay, upcoming events for this meetup. We run a, a different type of event from this one that we, that we call Hacker Hours. And it's a smaller group of people, more informal, um, about mentorship, getting mentored, mentoring other folks. Um, and uh, to show of hands, who's been to a Hacker Hours? Uh, who's in the room? Um, Irvin, are they useful? Helpful? You learn something? Okay. Um, so uh, the next one is going to be August 13th, and it's at uh, Red Rover, um, who has, is a frequent host of our Hacker Hours. Thank you, Red Rover. And then our next um, meetup here in, at Pivotal is going to be August 22nd. Um, I don't yet have a talk uh, lined up for that, so if you have something that you'd like to present, either a short kind of lightning talk or um, a talk that might be the main event, definitely talk to me about that. We can figure it out. Um, but that'll be August 22nd, so put it on your calendar. And um, I want to say thank you to our hosts tonight, um, Pivotal Labs, and, and to tell you a quick word about Pivotal, Pivotal I'd like to introduce uh, Micah Young, who is a pivot, um, and also, uh, by some strange stroke of coincidence, is my brother-in-law. Cool, yeah, it, um, a lot of, we have a lot of events here, and it's not always clear what here is. Um, Pivotal Labs is a... Uh, um, design, development, and product consultancy. Um, there's about 40 developers here. We work with startups. We work with uh, established companies. Um, 
usually working on Rails apps, but we've actually been doing more Ember work lately, more uh, front-end one-page apps. Uh, it's a really fun place to work. We test drive. We are agile. Um, learn a lot. It's a uh, very interesting place. So if you know a startup, if you're uh, or a company who's interested, looking for consultancies, or if you're looking for a great place to work, um, come talk to me or Alex in the back, in the back, or Luke as well, because he convinced me to work here. <laughs> thanks, Micah, and thank you. You know, the the pizza, the drinks, the space is all thanks to Pivotal. We're uh, deeply appreciative of it. Um, and then this also wouldn't be also would not be possible without uh, support from Yap, uh, which is my company, and uh, Yap is a uh, interesting company in that we um, have a, a product for consumers to create their own mobile app. Um, we also fund the uh, development of that product through consulting, uh, particularly Ember Consulting. So uh, we've got an insanely talented uh, group of um, engineers at Yap and um, doing lots, lots of good, good stuff on the open source front as well as uh, you know, for clients and for um, consumer web and mobile. Um, with that, I want to open up the floor to announcements from any of you. Um, anybody have anything that they'd like to share with the group? Okay, cool. Um, with that, then, I'm going to announce our first speaker. Um, uh, Andre Milan is uh, one of the um, programming wizards over at Red Rover HQ, um, and he's going to give a talk tonight about um, front ends and back ends. See if this works. Ah. Yeah, so So I'm gonna be talking about front end not being your back end or not letting your database design your app. Uh, and this comes from the fact that at Red Rover we've been using Ember Data for over a year now. Uh, and there's, whenever I speak to people about persistence, uh, they're always saying, you know, what should I be using? Ember model, Ember data, et cetera, et cetera. And quite frankly, because of following these kind of design principles, we found it really easy to use Ember data despite its shortfalls at the moment. Uh, and so looking at our app design uh, from a front end point of view has allowed us to really simplify the way that we interact with API and allowed us to use it uh, without much hassle uh, going forward. Uh, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So default thinking, when you start to create something in Ember or any one of these front-end apps, sometimes your thinking is really back the way that we used to build apps, which is very much thinking of, okay, well, what is my data structure? What are my models? Then you serialize them, and then you put them into an Ember model, and then you put that into controller and view to your templates. Uh, and what I would say is what you should start really thinking about when you're designing the app. Uh, if we're designing front-end apps that are living in the browser, we should be thinking of the UX first. So starting with our templates and our routes, going through to our views, going through to our controllers, all the way down to the actual models that's loose in the database when you're thinking about the application. Because uh, we're thinking about our users rather than thinking about our data ourselves as, as programmers. And what that leads to, I felt, is, is the Ember code itself gets much more simple. Because uh, as programmers, what we do is we manage complexity. We take things that are really complicated and we're trying to simplify them for ourselves and for each other uh, so that we can build these things that do magic. Uh, and where you start tends to be the place you get simpler. As you go further and further down your line of thinking, complexity creeps in. And when you start here, you end up with templates with a bunch of if statements in them. Uh, whereas in when you start here, you start clean, you start simple. And then the complexity starts to go more in the back end, which I think is where you want it in the end. So to show an example of this, uh, for us, we just launched a feature of a sign-up page that really signs up the users, uh, creates what well, we have, these things called bots, which are processes. So they buy the bot itself. Uh, at the same time, it signs them up. The form is super simple, again, from a UX point of view. We just want them to put in their name and an email and hit go. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time UX trying to simplify it down, make it really easy to, for them to understand. 
But the problem is that for us, what happens now uh, is a thing called a bot is created. That thing gets a profile. Uh, we create a user in the system. That user needs a network uh, because this is, again, for a group of people. So we need to create that network. We then need to create a profile for that user in that network. And so looking at the traditional way of kind of building apps, you would then want to go and build all these pieces uh, in Ember, make the member models, save them down. And your code, when you're designing that way, starts to get a little crazy. You know, you're creating and saving a user first, obviously, and then the network. And then you can only create a profile afterwards because the profile needs both the, both the user and the network. The bot needs the profile and the network as well. So you have to make sure that they're done in the right order. Uh, so you're either using some sort of crazy line of promises and doing several network calls and waiting for them to return to make sure that everything worked, uh, or you're doing something with transactions uh, and you're praying to the Ember data gods that it's going to work and that something in Ember data is built to make that happen, um, which it probably isn't. Uh, so, you know, we've been using it for so long now that we don't even try and even think of going down that route. Uh, instead, you know, you design by UX. So we take this thing and we say, well, this is a bot sign-up. This is what the user is doing right now, is they're signing up with a bot. And so that's one concept, one, one model, one object for the, from a UX point of view. Uh, so our code number is really simple. It's just the model has the two fields and the type of bot that they've signed up on, the page they clicked on. Um, the controller just creates it and saves it, and that's that. Uh, then back when it gets to Rails, you know, it just creates that sign up, and then calls this, you know, process create a command on the sign up, which is the thing that does all that complexity, that, you know, creates the profiles, creates the users, creates the network, if there isn't a network, joins it all together. All of that ugliness is now back closer to the database. It's in technologies like, you know, Rails and Ruby that are really easy to use unit test in this way so we can make sure that it's rock solid as it's happening instead of up in our Ember code where you're trying to deal with asynchronous, asynchronicity uh, and all the pieces that come with that. And so then the question becomes, you know, is this the right thing to do? It's certainly the easiest thing to do, uh, especially, you know, these are newer types of technology, so a lot of our experience is in that more back-end technology. It's in, you know, creating Rails classes and Ruby and testing that. Uh, so it's certainly easier to do it that way, but is it the right way to do it? And I think it is. You know, if you think of things of like separation of concerns, now your Ember code is really dealing with the UX and that kind of programming and logic uh, rather than the kind of persistence and dealing with the state of the world. And there's a reason I think that Ember right now is the thing that's being built and things like Ember data are going to come afterwards because we're really looking at how users interact first and then we're going to worry about the data because that's not what we're trying to interact with right now. We're trying to interact with people. You know, things like single responsibility. When you make changes, uh, if you look back at this thing here, when I change this, I'm changing UX. I'm trying to change it up so that my users experience something different, so that hopefully I can get more signups, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's when my Ember code's going to change. When, you know, my database decisions change, that doesn't matter as far as my Ember code goes. So the separation of responsibility really goes where it belongs. And then again, you're just telling your API that, hey, I've got this information that came from the user, this is what they were thinking, and then you let the complexity live in the back end where it belongs. You know, it's the kind of thing, the router is our world in Amber, and we're dealing with URLs and people, and I think we should really let something else take care of the database and all that kind of complexity that, that lives there, and really let ourselves live up in this this world of nice URLs and thinking clearly and thinking about the users and the people and giving them a simple world and shovel that complex stuff in the back. That's it. Thank you, guys. Well, so it depends. So you say if you design your back end or on your front end and the front end changes, do you have to change the back end? The thing is, it's, it's which parts cross that barrier uh, that'll be changing. So if your front end changes from a visual point of view, that doesn't matter. Uh, if it changes from what information it's passing to the back end, uh, then 
that membrane point is what's going to change. So you're going to be passing more information, so the back end has to know there's more information coming in. Uh, but if you look back at uh, this code here, right, the, the back end is literally grabbing this JSON and it's saying process. Right, so if that JSON changes, I need to look in here and figure out what changes with that. But that's, you know, that's one single point of the interaction. You're going to have to change it regardless. If the back end changes, you have to change the front end at certain places too. Uh, but it really keeps this, the network processing part of it where you can't really test that well. Uh, it keeps that the same. So if you're designing a back end for many different front ends, then you know that is going to leave your front end code more complex for sure, and that's kind of that's where your scope is is going to lie. If if your back end, you know, it depends on what's easiest for you in the long run, what's going to cost less money for your company as you're building your software, or for you, or time for you as you're building your software. Uh, if you can get a back end that's super simple because it's got to power lots of front ends, then sure. But if you're building lots of different complex front ends, maybe you need several different back-end layers in between those to do some translation uh, rather than actually making the JavaScript code and your Ember code more complex. Other questions? Does it make you any, like, any more uneasy? And I'm not saying that it makes me uneasy, that you're on the front end, you're sort of modeling the whole process as, like, your model is the entire process from the back end. I think, yeah, for me, I'm okay with that because, oh, sorry, the question is, do I feel comfortable or feel okay with the fact that your front end object is now fairly complex versus the back end pieces and that complexity changes between them? And I think that yes, because the complexity I feel right now lives where it belongs. When you're dealing with the sign up code in that front end view and what the user is interacting with, that complexity lives there and it doesn't live in my Rails models or controllers or objects there. That complexity is more how I want to think about persisting and when I go to other places. So in other places in our Ember app, we have that profile model and we have that bot model, but they're just not, they don't need to be thought about here. And so I can then have Rails send that back to Ember and Ember knows about them in that context. And so it's really your context that your user's viewing that you're trying to model in Ember and then you have some sort of way to map them all together, and that's what you're doing in the back end. Anyone else? Uh, so we're just doing, uh, so what database are we using to connect with Ember? Uh, so we're just doing very super simple Rails and Rails, uh, sorry, um, not just Postgres and Rails serializers, and then Ember data, uh, very much vanilla. We haven't really changed Ember data at all. And we've been able to do some pretty complicated things with that by using some of these tricks uh, of just trying to use the most simple parts of Ember data and really let the Ruby and the Rails and that stuff live in its own part and deal with its own complexity because we're experienced with doing that. And we're not as experienced with managing that complexity in the front end. So right now, so for this first one, oh sorry, what is the response uh, from the server, the JSON response, uh, and how do we feed that back in? So for the first one on create, uh, it actually gives us back a very similar object to what we started with, and then we have an update process that actually updates that same object within Rails, the spot sign up object, and it still does more manipulation of those other objects that I described. Later on, when I hit the profiles list, it's gonna pull the profiles from the server, and that'll pull a profile that was created in this process. And when I hit the bots list, it'll pull a bot that was created in this process. But they're separated because right now, as the user's signing up, I'm not trying to show them the things that they created yet, uh, so I don't have to. Uh, and if I did, I would just inline response in the JSON that object and bring it up with, with the response.
Cool. Um, so I'll give you uh, also just one example that we we ran into. We had to learn, learn the same lesson that Andre was talking about. On uh, Yap's editor, you can reorder pages, and this is a it's like a very different data interaction where you're changing the position of a bunch of pages at once versus actually editing one particular page. And we found it really useful to think about those interactions separately, even though on the back end it's one database record, you know, per page that ends up getting manipulated. So definitely, like thinking about these things contextually can be very useful. Um, so uh, why don't you come up and get set up? Um, our next uh, speaker is making his. Um, Our next speaker is making his world premiere um, technical presentation. No pressure. Um, Irvin is Irvin uh, Zahn is uh, is our intern over at Yap, and has been uh, do has dove in, in headfirst to uh, learning Ember uh, during the summer process here. Um, give it a sec. I think it's coming. Um, and uh, he struggled with one particular debugging, uh, debugging one particular thing. And I said, oh, you got to do a talk about this. Because it's something that I think all of us, or many of us either have run into or you will run into it. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Urban. All right, thank you. All right, so um, let's begin. So here's the setup. We have a bunch of yaps on the yap homepage. And these yaps are our products. A YAP is basically a personalized YAP that, uh, application that is created by users. And what the user wants to do is after they created the, the YAP, they want to share it with other people. And that's, what we're, that's the thing that I'm working with today. The feature I was trying to implement was a share email button. And that's right here on the bottom left. So what I'm going to do in the next slides is take you through my app, uh, show you a little bit of the code, and even though this tit uh, the title of this talk is Debugging for Dummies, but it's more like help me debug this code. So at the end of the slides, whoever, <laughs> I, I might ask the audience, and whoever raises their hand first gets a free beer on me. <laughs> yeah. Only those. So once you click on the email button, a light box comes up, and it's populated with um, some testing emails. On the top is a box in which you could add new emails. On the left side are unsent emails, and on the right side are sent emails. So I type in a valid email address. It turns green because it's cool. And then once you press on enter, it gets populated into a list. Now, once I exit the light box, and then I click on a different email button of a different app, this happens. Obviously, we don't want this to happen. If a user creates more than one app, they should not be forced to send it to the same people, right? So this was my problem, and let's dig in. So here we have the app router, the share email button, uh, is the share email route is nested under a YAP resource. And here's the YAP handlebars page. You click on the first link, and then it goes into your share via email of the YAP router, uh, the YAP route. And here's what it looks like. It, the share via email does two things. The first thing it does is it sets a controller for YAP. It sets the, uh, the model of the controller for YAP, the YAP that you clicked on. The second thing it does is transition into the Yap Share email route. And that's here. So I left all the console.logs to <laughs> let you guys get a sense of how, how much debugging there was. Um, I, I think I had a total of maybe 25 console logs at the peak of my debugging. And the setup, it has two components. First one is setup controller, where it sets the model of the share email to be the, the email list of the YAP model. The second thing it does, it, it renders the template into a light box. So the YAP model looks like this. It's just a simple Ember object. When it initializes, it creates, a, um, it creates an email. It pushes it into email list, which is an array. 
Now, what went wrong? <laughs> now, before I ask the audience, um, to get a sense of how long I've been working on this, or uh, had been working on this, I, um, usually when it comes to bugs, I tell myself that I will give myself at most 30 minutes before I ask one of the, my busy coworkers. And I, I think that's a good, I think that's a good deal because learning is messy and uh, once I go through all the painful debugging, I feel like I've <laughs> become a better person. Not with this though, not with this. It took me maybe two hours or so and I think at the peak of my frustration, uh, the CEO, Maria, commented that ever since I've been working on this Ember app, there has been a lot more profanity in my corner of the room. <laughs> so I finally gave up after hours of working on this and asked Luke. And I had about, I had many tabs open at the time in Sublime because there are a lot of controllers and views that I have not shown you. But I was just scrolling through all the tabs, looking for a good place to start. When he noted something, just offhand, a small offhand remark that fixed my problem. So I'll go through the code again. Here's a router, it hits the handlebars, it hits the YAPS route, the share email route, it renders a template and pulls from a model. What went wrong? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Luke solved it in less than five minutes. <laughs> yeah, when I asked him, he just. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so the problem is here. Even though I was creating a new model for each of my YAP, I was using the same email list. I was using the same email list, and I should have noticed that because back when I started and opened up the light box, there were seven emails populated, which isn't a coincidence because there were seven gaps on the page as well. I didn't think of that. So the simple fix to this is simply just setting the email list to null at first, and then when you initialize it, you set it to an empty array. So the moral of the story, um, I haven't really thought of one, but I think the good moral of the story is that when you're stuck on something, it might not be because of the big overarching Ember stuff. Before you start blaming like Ember data because it's cool and stuff, you should really ask someone who doesn't know your application well, someone who, in, in my case, Luke didn't even had no idea what was going on when I was scrolling through all the tabs because sometimes your mistake might be one in which you could learn from like a CS, a CS 100 class. So that's it. Thank you. Put the bit on, on the screen again. Uh, the, the place where the bug is on the screen, this one right there. Yep. It has something to do with pointers. It's because um, they store, even though that, um, even though that you might, you could even call it a different name instead of email list, but they are all pointers in and then they're pointing out the same things in the memory. So here, what we're doing here is we're doing ember.object.extend, which is defining a class. Uh. And, and so we're saying that the property, that this, the email list property of the class is this particular array. So in this, this gets parsed in JavaScript once, there is this, this property is pointing to some array in memory, the array pointer. But as we create each instance, that thing's still pointing to that same array of memory. So as you push objects onto it, pushing it onto the same one, even though you have different instances. Um, so this is, this, the same problem exists also with hashes here or on JavaScript and objects. If you have a class definition, you can all erase. Any, any non-primitive. So, um, very common JavaScript bug, not just a number. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it can 
cause some lots of hair pulling uh, for time to But that was great. Thank you very much. And congratulations uh, on your first uh, professional software development talk. Awesome. You want to come and get it set up? Um, cool. So uh, next up, we uh, have a talk uh, around the tooling around Ember. So um, actually writing your app is one thing, right? And then figuring out how to do development on your app is a whole other thing. Um, and so we're lucky to have tonight with us a member of the Ember.js core team, uh, perhaps one of, perhaps the most active core contributor in terms of um, number of issues closed and uh, pull requests merged. Um, Stefan Penner. Hello. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, that was a great talk, Irvin. Awesome. Uh, all right. So, who here's built an Ember app before? Who here's enjoyed the tooling to build an Ember app? Who here's drastically underestimated the time they've spent with the tooling to build their Ember app? Who, who here is embarrassed to say how much time they spent with tooling and tooling problems rather than building their Ember app? Um, why haven't you fixed it yet? <laughs> so I'm Steph. Um, I'm Canadian. <laughs> I work at Yap with Luke, Michael, Irvin. Is Ray here? Ray is here. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Um, Yap is, like Luke said, split into two parts. We do uh, consulting work, and we have a product as well. Um, the work that's today is inspired by lots of work that was done in Yap, but really inspired by some client work we've done recently. We were encouraged to make an open source project that would be appealing to JavaScript developers. And it turns out installing Ruby is a, is it echoing, or is it that just, you're good? All right, I guess just where I'm. It's, okay, this sounds better when I stand like this. <laughs> you guys mind it? <laughs> All right. Anyway, so it's like, ah, well, there's this node thing. There's a bunch of build tools. Let's build this app using these tools that the community likes because no one wants to install Ruby. Ruby actually is a pain in the butt to install. Having been a Ruby developer for many years, I do not think about this. But in retrospect, every time I help get someone installed with Ruby, it's like it's, it's non-trivial, unfortunately. Anyways, so Ember is meant for creating ambitious web applications. Turns out the tooling is a big pain, huge pain. It's not only a pain, it's super tedious. So for every, so you have a trade-off. You have the option of saying, um, all the stuff you don't think about that you need to get your app running. So more specifically, uh, with an Ember application, you have JavaScript files, CSS files, template files, image assets. All these things somehow need to come to the browser for development and production. The tooling is what basically facilitates that. All right, so Steph, it's, it's really not that bad, right? Just throw a bunch of script includes in there and you're good to go. And then you want to use CoffeeScript. Now you have to prepare the CoffeeScript. And then your app grows. So yeah, we have apps that have six, 700, 800 files. You can't have 800 script include tags and send this to your clients. They will spend probably a minute or two downloading all of these individual files. This is just not acceptable. So Ember App Kit was born. Rather than everyone going and reinventing the wheel 12 times, 
I just took a bunch of good ideas that we had, threw them up into a single repository, and then just pestered everyone I knew. And was like, come on, let's get together and let's solve a few problems. Mike jumped on board, Thomas, a whole bunch of other people here did. And uh, it's definitely a work in progress, but it is much better than what we had before. Basically, we want a unified goal. We all want to share this problem, and we all want to push it forward together, rather than every team spending, at first, 10 minutes, then an hour, then three days. Why don't we all just commit some time and just solve this problem and be done with it and then build our apps? Share some good ideas. Turns out, everyone has these little tidbits of knowledge. They've all gone through this process, a slightly different path, and there's been a really useful thing that they've learned. Well, let's put that back in the pool and share it. Iterate quickly. So one of the choices I made with AppKit was it wasn't going to provide a binary. It was just going to be a repository that moves really quickly, just so that we could get many good ideas, iterate quickly, fix problems quicker. And during this process, I realized there was a massive amount of pain points in Ember with the tooling. So I've been going through Ember and drastically improving how it works with the tooling just to make it much simpler, more magical, and a bunch of stuff that just sort of works. Since Ember's full of conventions, we can piggyback on these conventions to make a whole bunch of other things just work out of the box. While doing this, we noticed that there were a huge amount of other libraries that also sucked really bad. And uh, something like JS Hint, there were many improvements that needed to be done there. Thomas Boyd jumped on board, fixed JS Hint, and fixed a whole bunch of other things, which is awesome. There's a project called Ember Tools by Ryan Florence. And I'm really opposed to everyone going and making their own project. So I immediately reached out to Ryan and said, Ryan, we're doing similar things. You have a good binary with generators. I'm, we are iterating really quickly on what this thing that you want to generate should actually look like and how it should work. Let's work together. So me and Ryan have been working hard to eventually unite these two projects. Like I said, we have a good start, but there is still lots to do. So as you guys have time and energy, help out. Now the live demo. This doesn't come with any warranty. I can, oh my god. I just broke everything. Ah, there we go. All right. So first of all, Ember App Kit is super unprofessional. It's just a repository you check out, and that is the starting place for your application today. When you check it out, you get a relatively simple directory structure, and I'm going to try and show this. Is this clear? Can people see this? Seems OK. All right. So basically, we get an app directory, somewhat similar to Rails, a little bit more geared to what Ember has few crazy things that Steph added, like actions, probably going to leave it because no one else likes it, seems fine. <laughs> Hurt my feelings, but that's okay. Uh, operations that hold no state. So things that you pass all the arguments to and it does something, but it has no state. The, the reason I like this concept is that when you're testing and you have, let's say, a login action or a send email action or a connect to Twitter action or a tweet action. Well, when you're testing, you often don't want to interact with these services directly. You just want to replace them with something you can stub or mock out in a test. So that's the idea of actions. Who knows if it'll last. Anyways, so come on. What is happening? All right, live coding for the fail. All right, so to get Ember AppKit installed, you basically have to install Node and NPM, do an NPM install in the directory, which I won't do because it will probably fail because NPM is NPM. You have to spell stuff correctly. I'm going to jump straight to what I think is one of the most useful tasks. It's basically starting a test server, which runs an app. In addition to running the app, it automatically runs Karma tests for you. 
I'll go into detail what that is. But basically, a file changes, test run. Not only do tests run, but they actually ran in browser. So as I change stuff, it runs headless, and it also runs in a browser. But this is kind of cool. Turns out we have to write projects that run in many browsers. You can actually just connect all the browsers on your machine or other remote machines. Come on, Firefox, you can do it. There we go. So now I have three browsers connected. I change this file. It goes runs the tests headless and in the three browsers, which turns out to be pretty useful. You can imagine a scenario where maybe you have a second machine running a bunch of IE VMs, just getting tests. Maybe not live, but maybe somewhat live. Now, this is useful, but it's not it's like great stuff. I can do this with just Karma. But Ember AppKit does a few other neat things. So let's TDD something really quickly. I'm going to, I just want to make, I want to post one. So I want to visit a post one, and I want it to fetch a post for me. So let's quickly TDD something here. You guys are, by the way, my syntax and my spelling mistake. You guys are all my pair programmers right now. So if anything goes wrong, it's your fault, not mine. So what I'm using here is Ember testing. Ember testing is kind of like what you would get Selenium, but using pure JavaScript and Ember. It means you get really fast, non-brittle tests, hopefully. What's up? What, what, what am I missing? Post one. Oh, OK. Good call. All right, so th this is clearly failing. and. Tests might not be the clearest thing in the world, but it turns out normal browser tests work just fine as well. Oh, I can't actually. The screen is too small. I can't rerun this test. But assume I can rerun this test. We can just. <laughs> tooling, tooling is the ghetto. All right. This is where AppKit starts to become quite neat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a route, because we need a, a route for this. I need my like kinesis advantage here to actually, I have a retarded keyboard that I need to actually type anything. No. Maybe. I don't I don't think so. The test is failing for which reason? Oh, you know that that probably makes sense. Yep. That that is actually not supposed to pass. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I have lost my mouse. Oh, there we go. All right. So turns out it, with asynchronous tests, it's really important to say the number ex expectations that you want. Pair programming for the win. Is it getting here? OK. There's a post one. I don't, are you sure these quotes need to be there? I believe you guys, but. Oh, you want OK to be on top of this file. 
Ah, uh, this is what we want, actually. We want... Uh... <laughs> All right, I think... All right, now we're on track. Okay, so given that we need this, what is... What is the next thing that we need? We basically need a post model. <sighs> Why? And rather than having Ember data in this project, I'm just going to write the find myself. Put a quick debugger in here. So this syntax is a little bit strange. Export default post. Well, it turns out the next version of JavaScript has a module system. And Ember AppKit uses this module system to kind of do a bunch of magic for you. Does that mean we can only use Ember AppKit when the next version of JavaScript? Uh, no. Uh, okay, that's right. Um, we a uh, project that Thomas has been contributing to. Uh, we transpiled the next version of JavaScript module system into today's JavaScript into something that's usable today. All right. So the question was, is this an ECMAScript complete polyfill? Absolutely not. It is a subset of the module system. Um, but I think this lightning talk is going a little bit too long. So if you guys want me to continue, I can. But maybe go for it. Continue. All right. <laughs> we should actually not continue this. <laughs> <laughs> I am far too tired to make this actually work. To Anyways. Um, you actually don't have to require the module. The Ember app kit can do that for you automatically. Just by placing it in the correct folder. So if you put the routes in the routes folder, the models in the model folders, the controllers in the controller folder, Ember app kit will assemble this all for you. And automatically your app will assemble and just work, assuming you're not too tired. Anyways, uh, do you guys have any questions? Um, likely, yes. So Ember Rails is fantastic for people that are starting a Rails project or have an existing Rails project and would like to just drop it into their application. Uh, the Ember App Kit is used for two things. It's used to explore what it would be like if these modules actually existed. And also, there's a whole spectrum of people that don't have Rails apps. And then there's another spectrum of people that have Rails apps, but might have one, two, or three, or even more Ember apps that all plug in together. And Ember Rails doesn't really work that well. And other people just like to keep their apps separate. Uh, any other questions? So you're looking at Yeoman? Um, I have not. So this project, ex question. the question is, have I been looking at Yeoman? And uh, I have briefly looked at it, but this project does not care about generation. It only cares about what are the components needed to build and to allow this app to exist. Something like Ember Tools or something like Charcoal, which Thomas is working on, can fill the gap of generation. This is merely to stress, assuming something exists, do all the components work? Can, can you say that again, sorry? Yes. So it doesn't do the auto assembling for you, and it doesn't use the ES6 module system stuff for you, and then it doesn't use a default resolver to assemble all this stuff for you. And it has a little bit more opinion. This is purely the thing that would potentially be generated by a yeoman or by whatever, if that makes Does that answer your question correctly?
The question is, does Karma testing or test frameworks like it, like Testim, uh, do they work with multiple devices or virtual machines? Yes. Uh, so it just binds to your uh, to a port. And if, you have, if your firewall is open and your network traffic is allowed, any device that can connect to that port can connect to it, and the tests will run on that device. Were that, you had two questions. Fantastic. Yeah, I was just going to say that Karma can also be configured to launch your browsers for you and run the tests, and you can even create custom browser scripts. So you could probably even create a script that would launch a VM and then run the test in IE or something like that all for you, just from the command line. So uh, in addition to that, uh, the latest version of Karma actually has a script to kick off stuff in browser stack and or sauce labs, which is somewhat interesting. Um, and it, this one, by default, opens up a Chrome browser if it can find it. But there's a configuration file where you can just specify all the browsers you want to open up. Um, and, and actually, back to your point, um, Although Yeoman does some of these things, uh, the, the majority of the work that's gone into this project has actually been uh, in that auto assembly stuff, which has been inside of Ember. So although that might do some of it, there's been a massive amount of work to make it even more friendly with the Yeoman stuff. Any other questions? So the question is, what is this command line thing that you are using? Um, so I like tabs inside tabs inside tabs. So I, I am, I am in, a, in, a, in a terminal. I don't like using my mouse. This is probably back to playing video games a few years ago, where I used to play a lot of video games, a lot of StarCraft. Um, I don't like using my mouse, because I find as soon as I use my mouse, um, it's a little bit of a shift. So I have a terminal window. Inside that terminal window, I have a virtual terminal window which means that uh, I can close this and resume it. Uh, and I can just resume it. Now this is oh, great stuff. Turns out um, I often do work on a remote machine, which is faster than my laptop. And I can just let it run there forever. Or I can just, um, so there are some perks because of that. In addition to that, I can have my editor and my command line within a keystroke of each other, which I, I find useful. Some people just can't stand this, but I enjoy it. All right. Um, question number two. Um, how do you read the output on the bottom half of the screen? Um, so the, the, the current output is non-ideal. It is definitely a mess, and it definitely needs to be improved. That's why I immediately jump to uh, viewing it here. Because it gives you sort of visual output, <laughs> except that um, in such a small resolution that this projector has enforced upon my laptop, you can't actually see how cool this is. Uh, this is my Ember app in a window, and this is the key unit tests behind it. Typically, it would probably look something more like this. And you can actually then experience that specific test run, watch it fail. Um, so I basically use this output to tell me that there's a problem, and then I will jump to something that's specific for it, such as the browser, and investigate. Now, in addition, the Karma testing allows you to go into a debug mode in any of those browsers and inspect the state there as well. OK, so does that mean it only tests the functions, not the look of the website that you're building? Um, it only tests what you can define and tell your app, tell the tests to do. So it doesn't invoke the the methods in this case, it will look for a element that looks like something. So it'll look for a link called post, and it will click it, wait for it to finish, and then inspect the output. So it's entirely possible that it might look deformed or not good for a user, but it's purely testing the functional ability of the website. OK, and then the last question, um, you mentioned for the back end you, that you can use Rails. But I'm wondering, are there other back end languages that you could use with this? Absolutely. Ember basically doesn't care. Uh, lots of people that do use Ember also use Rails. That is basically a coincidence. Um, typically, people that use Rails, they like the convention because they, um, they understand that if they invest some time and learn a convention, uh, that convention will do a lot of work for them. And it will also help them work well with a team of people. Because then rather than arguing about weird convention things, you can say, well, you know, the tools we're using have these conventions. Let's just follow them and worry about our product. 
Ember follows those same guide, similar guidelines, but in the web, in the in the front end space. And because of that, it seems to attract the similar similar type of people. Basically, Ember cares about nothing on the back end. Uh, you just have to decide on the communication between your back end and your front end, and Ember will do its thing. Any other questions? Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, and I apologize for a horrible demo. <laughs> All right. Before we get on with the, the main talk of the evening, um, I want to take a little bit of a break, and you have a, a special instructions during this break. And that is to um, find somebody in this room that you don't know, introduce yourself, um, and uh, find out how they're using Ember, just in one sentence or so. Or so. Uh, and then I'm going to call on somebody randomly when we come back, and you're going to tell me about the person you met. Uh, there's more drinks. There's more, some, more, some more pizza. So we're, we'll go in just like th three or four minutes. We're going to start. So let's see. Um, in the in the green shirt right here, gentlemen, sir. Um, who who did you meet and what are they doing with Ember? Uh, yeah, I met Rob here, and uh, he is working his way through, as many of us have, uh, just getting started, uh, going through the to do app on the uh, guides and uh, having some fun and also wrangling with some uh, some little issues. So. Best way to learn. Thank you. Um, and just, just so everybody knows, I think you know, one of the reasons why we started this meetup uh, over a year ago now um, is to grow the community in New York, um, which has been happening, which is awesome. Um, and so uh, to the extent that, that that's uh, valuable and important to you guys too, get to know each other. Um, because you know one of my favorite sayings I, I've heard a long time ago in a, another software community is... Um, there are no smart guys or gals, there's just us. So, there you go. Um, our next speaker, um, I remember distinctly uh, seeing in the audience at the first meetup that we did, um, which was uh, in April of 2012, uh, and he had a red, red bandana around his forehead, and uh, intent, it was intensely digesting everything that uh, Yehuda Katz was our speaker that day, everything that he was saying. Um, and little did I know that that young man who was in, intently digesting all that stuff was going to go on to contribute one of the, um, the most important pieces of you know, changes to Ember um, that's, that's happened in its short lifespan, um, which is uh, a, a major um, refactor of the Ember router. And so we're very fortunate to have uh, with us today to take us through the Ember router um, in general and as well as in particularly the new stuff, Alex Metchner. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. I swear that the young man, the youth thing, seems to, seems to come up a lot. This must be this whole cherubic demeanor. But even, I did this, uh, the Ember hot seat um, three days ago, and that even somehow managed to come up. So I can't seem to elude it. I'm sure 10 years from now I'll look just as comically young looking. Anyway, my name's Alex. Today I'm talking about the Ember router. And just to sort of, uh, sort of set, set the stage, this presentation can kind of, is a little bit flexible to how in-depth people want to go. I'm going to try to cover a good deal, but um, the whole time the rule goes just like call out questions along the way if something doesn't make sense because there's kind of going to be a mix of um, new folk and then other people who have might maybe fought some of these router battles before who are just want to learn about some of the new cool things that have been added to help you along the way. But I really do want to have this um, be useful for both people getting started and people who are also veterans. So please just call the questions as you have them. I'm happy to stop and digress a little bit without letting it get a little too out of hand, but um, without further ado. Um, so about me, my name is Alex. I'm a New York City based Ember consultant. I've been developing Ember for about a year and a half or so. Um, before that, mostly just doing lots of real stuff. I feel like it's a pretty similar background to a lot of people here. Um, I've been contributing to Ember for about six months or so, and uh, I created this uh, alternative to the handlebars templating language called uh, Emblem.js, which you might like if you like indentation based templates and want something that will actually work with uh, Ember's you know, uh, automatically updating templates, um, which is the only one that you can use if you don't want to use handlebars. And also, I uh, help out. I'm like 
half of Embercast.com, which is a screencasting site. We don't have very many screencasts yet, but I'm paired uh, with uh, Eric Brin of Embercore fame. So check that out. There's going to be a lot of stuff uh, I'm covering tonight that is relevant to a particular Embercast uh, on there. So get, take, take a look later after this presentation, because there's definitely going to be a lot of overlap. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to talk about the router, what it is, why we care, and why we are so proud of it in the Ember world compared to perhaps some competing frameworks. I'm um, going to be going over some basic concepts, which will probably be you know, a little bit similar between the different frameworks, but I want to give everyone a little bit of a background before we're getting, um, going deep into some of the more complex stuff. I'm going to talk about the router and how you can treat it, uh, how, it will, how it is a state machine and um, some of the patterns that can come of that. And I'm going to f sort of finish up with sort of the cooler bits, the stuff that I've been really working on, particularly um, through the month of uh, June. And a little bit of a demo to tie some of this stuff together and give you guys something a little bit more concrete than just tons of words. So the Ember router, what is it? Um, you'll, if you have a Rails background, you've been acquainted with a concept called the router. And if you've been in, if you have some familiarity with Backbone or Angular, they also have similar concepts. And all of them, uh, a router is basically this thing which maps URLs to application state. So when you're clicking around your single page app, um, and you want, basically, as you go to different pages, you want your address bar at the top to be able to change and update um, so that you can, at any point, refresh your page and then not have to start from the beginning again, or you can grab your URL, send it to somebody else, and they can load the page and see exactly what you're looking at. Um, and vice versa, as you kind of click around these pages, you know, you're going to be using this router to, to sort of generate these links on the page. And um, also, it's, you know, a, to be able to uh, be running your application and be able to click back and back and forwards and so on and so forth and just have it work is really a crucial um, thing to have and that's something that the router does for you. So a word on URLs. Um, it's not something that, can, that you really just want to tack on to an existing application because one, um, it's very, very difficult to do and when your app doesn't have this sort of functionality, it's very frustrating and you can you know, to, to go to an application that has a lot of like special cool effects and gimmicks and lots of cool things you can do with it, but still not have it sort of update this one crucial thing that you expect out of your, your web experience is, is really frustrating. And um, it's been sort of said, particularly uh, from Tom Dale and Yehuda, that if your app doesn't handle URLs, it's not a web application, which is strong words, but pretty much true. Um, you know, you don't want to just rebuild a, some, uh, an application that makes sense for a native desktop scenario on the web, you actually want your web application to kind of uh, make use of that, those common patterns that you expect from interacting with a web page. Uh, and URLs are very crucial. So like I said, it, it's extremely hard. Not only, do you want to, not only do you want to avoid the pattern of just sort of tacking it on to an existing application that you've written, but it's really, really hard to do that. Uh, I'm sure all of us have written an app uh, you know, of um, single page application veterans here have probably written an app where it seems like it's working, you sort of got your URLs working, and you press the back button and nothing happens, and from then on it's sort of screwed up. It's a pretty easy thing to do. And uh, Ember's router, um, the, the, the patterns are there for you to uh, do this the right way and hopefully not run into that stuff so much. So who here has watched the cage match between Tom Dale and uh, Rob Connery, um, an Angular guy? It is admittedly not the most fair cage match, but a lot of the concepts that we'll be going over tonight and the importance of URLs and how stuff can spiral out of control in terms of complexity and um, things not really making a whole lot of sense, um, it's very easy for these the spiraling out of control to happen for these alternative frameworks that don't really put the router and the URLs front and center. So watch this. It's, you know, it's informative and also really hilarious if you're um, a major troll, uh, which in this case, you know, <laughs> The, it's, it's, again, it's not very even. You have this uh, author of a framework going against a guy who does screencasts for another, so obviously the, the troll um, Ember author was going to win. Um, by the way, uh, who is this, by the way? Yeah, it's Tom Dale. <laughs> In case he's watching it um, from California or Portland, and he's just like, oh, maybe they won't know it's me. I just want to make it clear. That is Tom Dale. <laughs> um, so in Ember, the router is not tacked on. It is a first class citizen. And basically Ember is going to, when you, when you go through the docs, when you're trying to learn Ember the first time, 
you're pretty much going to encounter the router and the router DSL right away. And in particular, compared to the other frameworks, um, the router gets the, the API and the thought that goes into making this stuff as easy as it could possibly be and as intuitive as it could possibly be because it's a very tricky thing and lots of moving different parts. The API gets a lot of love in Ember. And in particular, your sort of jumping point is going to be the uh, router domain specific language that you can use to pretty much sketch out an app. So this basic approach of nesting all of your routes should look pretty familiar if you've ever, oh, sorry, question. Is there something I came across last week? I don't think it's 100% in my uh, memory anymore, but it's something. There's a difference if you do this dot resource um, post, and then you have the second line, now you have this dot root comments. So then you have a post comments view, a post comments controller. But if you would write this dot resource comments, you don't, like, it doesn't concatenate the two. But let's come back to that. Well, I'm, I'm going to be going over a lot of this stuff. Um, actually, I probably don't have a whole lot to say on the specifics of route versus resource. The question was basically, uh, between these two um, definitions, route versus resource, different things uh, in the namespacing of the kinds of generated routes and controllers that are expected, they differ slightly. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, some of it may, might make a little bit more sense as we go through it, even though looking at it, it's not a major focus. But um, I'll definitely address that in a bit. Um, this is the same thing as before uh, from the previous page. Basically, what's, what's nice about this is there was previous versions of the Ember router where um, you would say that, the, okay, there's a about page, there's a contact page, and then to actually get these pages to show up, you had to very meticulously define all these different views and controllers and temp I mean, templates you're going to have to do anyway. But the great thing about this uh, version 2 of the router, I mean, there's so many versions. The stuff that I worked on was something called the facelift router, and then there's new, 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 new router and all this stuff. Um, but back in the old days, it was really, it was pretty rough. It was still better than <laughs> the competing stuff out there. But... Um, you had to just type a lot to get all your views and controllers there. But what's cool about this router DSL is that this line alone, you know, ignoring everything else that's there, will generate a lot of things for you that unless you actually have to override those defaults, um, you can just, you know, not even have to write anything in your code. You're going to get a controller, an about controller, an about view, um, and an about route. And a lot of times you can... I don't know, a lot of times, maybe half the time, you can get away with just not writing any of these components until you actually need to override some of that default behavior. So this guy alone here is going to say there's a URL called about, which is going to link you, which is going to take you to a, a state of your app that's making use of the about controller and possibly an about view to display this about template. So lots of different components. Why are there so many things? So it's, again, we're still in the sort of review refresher portion um, but let me just talk through a little bit of all these different components because um, really it's the router that stitches all these things together so that you hopefully don't have to think too hard about all this stuff. But, you know, there's a template, there's a route, and a controller, and a view, and all these things that are expected or generated for you um, when you start sketching out your application's state using this app.router.map. So, what is a template? Well, of all the different components, the controller, view, and um, route, the template is the one that you're going to have to, it's the one you absolutely have to specify and describe what it actually is because it is your HTML that will be displayed when you navigate to that route. You know, if you can, you can have Ember generate a controller and a view and all these other things for you, but you at least need to tell your app what you're displaying when you go to slash about or slash uh, contact or something. So, um, in, templates, in, in Ember, templates make use of the, the language handlebars, which looks a lot like mustache, if you've got some familiarity with that. You can also use the emblem uh, templating language that I was talking, that I was talking about earlier. Um, but this here is just handlebars. It looks like HTML because that's what it is, but it's got these little mustache, um, sideways mustache is where it gets its name from, um, of where all your dynamic content goes. So as you can probably tell, if this were a template in your application, it would say, he hello, blank, and then use the, the name value off of something that we'll talk about in just a second, and fill in that little blank, comma, how are you? So um, just a little bit of minor trivia, which should be pretty clear to people who have written this stuff before. In Ember, 90% of the time, a, temp a template is going to display its dy dynamic data by getting data from a what? Controller, right? This is the next component to talk about. So templates are driven by data on the controller. Um, I'm not going to go, well, actually, I will go into some detail about this. Um, 
controllers, there are a few different flavors of controllers and depending on like how your route works and depending on whether there's data associated with your route and depending on whether that data is an array versus just an object, um, the controller that will be created for you or the one that you can sort of specify yourself is, it might be an object controller or an array controller or it might just be this third kind of default controller. But what's cool and awesome about the object controllers and array controllers is that they have this property which is that they proxy through their properties and data bindings to this underlying object. And you'll see in just a moment why that is a cool pattern to have. Um, but it basically means that when you're presenting, if, if templates are being driven by controllers, it's possible for you both to have your controller define data that is going to be displayed by your template. And it's also possible for this object that is being proxied to by this controller to also um, be that which is kind of presenting this data. So for instance, if you have a user model, um, you're navigating to users slash uh, Alex, and you know that this, whatever your backend is, has some user information about Alex stored in the database. And on the front end side, this, all this data, when you load it from the server, is going to be stored in this model, uh, this user model, which has information with you know, my ID, my name, and so on and so forth. But then there's going to be additional things that don't actually make sense to be saved in the database. Um, and for this kind of non-persisting data that's still useful to be displayed in your template, such as, I don't know, have you expanded the number of rep repositories that I've contributed to, or uh, have you opened and closed the comments, or what's being displayed, what's highlighted, all of these things are extra data that obviously doesn't make sense to, um, to save in the, the database in any way, unless you're you know, going buck wild with preferences and you know, so on and so forth. Um, you want to be able to store some of this extra information on a controller, but then you also, whenever you need to just reach in and get the name from this model, this persisting model, um, you've got this nice proxying behavior, which I will, it's probably best to illustrate this from this slide. So imagine you have this index uh, template, and because it's you know, index.handlebars, it's going to be driven by this index controller. Now, I mean, this is just a demonstration again. You're not really going to be specifically defining these hardwired strings in your controller, but if this is the output here, um, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that you can, this content object is the proxied sort of underlying model that all of your data bindings are going to sort of go through if you request them from your template. So I just have foo and bar here, and I can sort of automatically type in this stuff, and the output template at the bottom is going to change. And I can also um, change the content of bar, which is living inside this proxied model or proxied object, and change this here. And you can see that on the template side of things, I don't have to say content.bar because this because object controllers are all these are under are sorry because object controllers are object proxies, and they sort of present the data the as if it's sort of flattened to um, templates, which keeps your templates you know a lot simpler and. You know, the template doesn't have to think about, oh, is this data that's being persisted? Do I need to reach through and say content dot whatever, some property? It's more just really your, the, the, the good pattern to sort of maintain is to have your templates just um, only be concerned about the data that is specific for it to display and then have all that sort of magically handled by your proxying controller. I don't know if I explained that too well. Are there any questions about this particular thing before moving on? Good. So the view, honestly, the view, I think it might have been a little more important in uh, previous iterations of Ember, but oftentimes you don't need to generate your own view. And for what it's worth, it might be worth saying a quick thing about it. If you're coming from a Rails background, view is kind of interchanged with the word template. When they say view in a Rails setting, they're very often just talking about the HTML that's got, uh, like the ERB HTML that's got some dynamic data inserted in there. In Ember and, and, and a lot of other uh, JavaScript frameworks, it's a separate thing. It manages the DOM elements. It can provide some extra functionality that, you know, if very often you can get away with just having all of your templates driven by data coming from a controller. But occasionally you need to do some special things like drag and drop. You need to have some special DOM interactions that don't really make sense to um, fit in the controller. So in these situations, you are actually going to make use of the view object. But very often, you can just get away with using your templates and your controllers and not even having to think too much about it. So I won't say very much more about it. And finally, of this sort of four, uh, four components to talk about, the one thing that's also, the, the thing that's also generated by you know, this.route about is going to be a route object. And 
Um, I'm going to try to focus more on this sort of thing. Uh, the, the, re the rest of the stuff is really just to sort of bring people up to par as much as possible. But the route object is going to be responsible for defining lots of behavior for what happens when you transition into this route. What kind of uh, async data needs to be loaded, what needs to be fetched from the server to eventually be given to a controller to present as data to the templates. So definitely this is going to be the most important job. So if you, if you navigate to post one, two, three, you would expect that after everything's loaded, all the data's come back from the server, that you're going to be displaying information in your template about uh, the post object with the ID of one, two, three. And you know it can be a little tricky to figure out how all that happens, but this is the job of the route. The controller shouldn't ideally know much about fetching data. I mean, you can think of some patterns where it makes sense, but for the most part, if you navigate somewhere, you really want it to be the responsibility of this route object to take this information that you've navigated to post one, two, three, and figure out what, how you need to query the server and how you need to get that data from the server into your app. So a quick example of this. Um, from, the, from some of the previous slides, I had this um, thing here, this declaration of a route or a resource, which is sort of like a top level um, route which can be nested. Um, I say this.resource.post, and I say that the URL that's um, associated with it is post slash, and then this dynamic segment post ID. So if I navigate there, and I you know, just type in the address bar, or after the, you know, the hash bar, or the hash sign, I go to post slash one, two, three. This is going to match with this thing that I um, defined up here. And then uh, the most important hook that is in charge of taking this, you know, the URL that you navigated to and figuring out what needs to be loaded is this model hook. And, you know, in some of the stuff that I was working on, this facelift router, it's got some friends that I'll be sort of talking about in a little bit. But this is sort of the centerpiece. This is what, this is how you figure out, you know, based on what URL I'm at, what data needs to be loaded. And, so you can sort of tell this is what's going to happen every time that you refresh your app or if you press the back button in your app. And um, if you can get this right, you get a lot for free in your apps, which is very difficult to sort of tack on to other apps as far as maintaining application state and maintaining a good URL that is representative of that as you move around in your application. So quick review of everything I just talked about before getting into some more router specific stuff, even though it's all very much stitched together by the router. The template is your HTML, which has these sort of dynamic holes that um, are filled in with data from your controller. Um, and controllers can proxy through to an underlying model to sort of give you a unified, flattened pattern. Um, views, you're often just fine using the automatically generated one. Um, but, uh, but if you need to do some kind of complex UI events and some other um, more complicated use cases, you can make use of it. Um, and routes are going to be the thing that are res responsible for sort of parsing your URL and figuring out what needs to be loaded into your app when you navigate to such a route. So, um, maybe I can go back to, uh, let's see here. Nope, this is a good example. So the router, one of, in addition to sort of navigating all these complex async issues, it's also a pattern that's set up for you to treat as a state machine. So um, there is... It, this is pretty much a challenge of every single JavaScript MVC framework. You have all sorts of events that can be fired as the user moves a mouse around the screen and clicks on this and that. And all of these things are going to be sending these events that, sh that um, can be hand handled in a variety of different places. But um, a very kind of tried and true pattern is to make use of a state machine um, to sort of say, okay, if I'm in this state, uh, if I'm in this particular route, um, I only want to respond, I'll, when somebody clicks this button, I'm going to respond a certain way. And if I'm in a different route, a different route might say, okay, I'm going to handle this event in a way that is specific to me. And it's way better to make use of this pattern, which is quite a common way of handling these sorts of problems, rather than, say, having a single handler and then having a bunch of if statements in a row that say, okay, am I in this route? Okay, if I'm in this route, then do this kind of thing. Else, if the route is this other thing, then I know how to do this. It gets very messy. It gets very hard to maintain this kind of code. So it's very, it's very much a good idea to um, adopt this pattern of treating this, um, treating the router as a state machine because it very much is. Um, so I have an example here. Um, so for instance, these event handlers. Uh, if you're defining a route, you know, about route or contact route from the example I was using before, um, and you want to have these routes respond to 
um, perhaps clicking a button on a certain template. Um, what, the, what you're going to want to do is basically define this event hash, events hash on that route as is sort of described here. This, so if we were defining our application to have this top level foo resource and then nested in that is going to be foo slash bar and um, for every one of these routes that gets generated by um, this definition here, if we had an events hash, um, if we had an events hash on each of those routes that said do something, that said alert, I am you know, the name of this route, and then it bubbled upward, which you can do by returning true, um, then if we were on the bar.index route and we click this do something button here, which is basically what this handlebars snippet would generate, then we would expect this to fire on the leafmost active route, which is going to be bar.index, and then have it bubble up to bar, then foo, and then your kind of top level implicit route, which you only enter once, you never really leave in the lifetime of your application is this application route. So if I click this, we'll see I am bar.index, which is what we expect. Then we would expect bar, then foo, then application. And this sort of gives you an idea of how you can define um, uh, an event at any step in the route hierarchy and bubble it up if you know, for any reason you want a more generalized handler to take care of it. Question? The question is, um, because it's possible to handle some uh, these UI events in your controller as well, um, the question is, what's the recommendation for when you should handle these on a route versus a controller? And I'd say, um, in probably most cases, you want to put everything in the, in the route because, well, one, you can. It's, it's not much harder to take something that you would define in your controller and just move it onto the route. And if you put it on the route, you have the guarantee that there's not going to be some weird async thing that happens after you've already navigated away from a route that's going to fire. And because it's you know, handled by that controller, even though you're not on that route, it might fire some logic that you wouldn't expect because you've already left that state. So it's most often a better pattern to put that stuff in your events hash on your route. I do the same thing. It's, I probably. If, you're, if your action is modifying data in your controller, you might want it to be stopped at the controller. But if your action is modifying something at a higher level, it should probably percolate through to the higher level. It makes little sense to go up to a controller and then back down into a, into a, up to a route and then have the route then manipulate a controller. So if you're manipulating the content of the controller, that's the direct parent of the action, stop there, do your work. If it's manipulating something further up, like moving around or performing an action, well, it makes a lot of sense to just throw it up at the router. Right. I might not be able to repeat all that, but um, <laughs> that, that was great advice, just on the memory shot after all this ember, ember development. Um, any, any, any more questions before we're moving on? Good? Okay. So this is just a quick little graph of what I was just talking about. When you have in your template a button and it says, and then within, within this sort of button tag, you set, have an action, which is do something. This just basically means that when you click this, this HTML button, it's going to fire this event called do something. And the starting point is to fire on the controller. And it's basically an asset controller. Do you have an event called do something? And in our previous example, we didn't. We were just letting it be handled on the route. So if you don't have this do something event on the controller, it's going to basically forward to the router. And the router is going to start on the, uh, it's going to look at its currently active routes and start on the leafmost state and look for um, this do something handler in, in this events hash. And it's going to basically go up the route hierarchy until it finds one that has this do, do something event. And if it goes all the way to the top and there is no do something event anywhere, then it fires an error. So you can see that you've got some uh, events firing from your template that um, aren't being handled by anything. So uh, I don't want to talk so much about this because this is a little bit more review. Question? It looked like in the example you did where it was calling alerts as it bubbled up the routes. Yes. So it was like it was continuing on after like the, the lowest route handled it and then it continued to call the route above that. Is that the normal behavior? No, that's, that's straight. Oh, well, I hate. For, for what it's worth, never use magenta because it doesn't show up on uh, projectors at all. I'm actually highlighting this guy right here. Scumbag, uh, what's, what's that? Sublime has that one 
um, completely invisible magenta font, or just there's gaps in your code whenever you put it on a projector. But so does this uh, selection thing. So yeah, basically, it's um, if you return true from uh, one of these handlers in the events hash, that's going to cause that bubbling handler, um, bubbling behavior to happen. Otherwise, if you let this return true out, it would just stop there. Events handle done. Um, but yeah, that's that's what this comment, you know, return true, make event bubble means. Um, so when you have like deeply nested routes, because you've said, you know, this dot resource, then inside that resource, indented is another thing, foo slash bar, and so on and so forth, you are going to need a way to um, keep on injecting these child routes into child route templates into their into their parent route templates. And I'll have an example of this in the next slide, but basically that's where you, you make use of this outlet helper. helper. Um, and I'll just move on to this example. So say we've got a quick app sketched out which has a foo parent route and underneath that's got a bar parent route and then this implicit bar.index and it's got this about page and it's also got this other implicit top level index page. Um, and then imagine that for each of these templates, like every single template that would possibly be loaded from your top level application to index to bar index and everything else, imagine they all share the same template which prints out the template name and then has an outlet. This is pretty much on the right side is a visual rep representation of what it looks like to have all these outlets um, just render inside of each other. So index is this top level. I'll start on about because you can, it's not implicit. You can actually see that it's defined here. But if you go to bar index, which is going to be this, like within here in, the, in this two levels, levels of nesting, then you'll see that at the top level you have this application uh, handlebars. And in, inside its outlet is going to be the template for foo. And inside foo's outlet is going to be bar. And then inside bar's outlet is going to be bar slash index that handlebars. So this is a very, th this in particular is where that um, cage match video really started to go awry for um, the contender of Tom Trolldale. And it's very tricky to get this, this right. There's, um, and in Angular in particular, they're kind of getting closer with uh, a sort of side project called the UI router, but um, it's, it's got its own sort of restrictions that are pretty tricky to work with. But this is very hard to get right. Um, but it's in, in, in Ember, they've got all the right tools for you to put that together the right way. Um, so, the more interesting portion of this, or at least the portion of the talk that I'm more happy to talk about and more excited about, is sort of how to, how to manage really complex async operations using the router. And this is going to use a lot of stuff that's kind of new to RC6. I went over some of this a month ago at the previous meetup and sort of blasted through some examples. Some of it might seem a little bit familiar, um, but I'm going to try to go at least maybe a tiny bit more in depth. So, basically, so much of the work that I put in in June or so to work on this facelift router all resolved around the concept of really embracing promises, which promises was, was the whole theme of, of last month's meetup. Um, and as a general review, a promise is an object that encapsulates an eventual value. Uh, and you interact with um, this eventual value. You, you pass a handler to it by using this dot then, which, you know, that's what this guy is all about. Um, I'm very you know, happy to represent promises. I think they're awesome, and I think they solve a lot of problems. And they also you know, give you a little bit of a foot gun, because sometimes they can hide your errors. But for the most part, it seems to be the, the future of how to think about async versus you know, having these crazy nested callbacks and uh, very messy error handling. So um, you get sort of, with promises, you get this sort of async try-catch behavior, um, which, yeah, question. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, some some kind of what errors? <laughs> the the question was, what was I saying? What kind of errors do you get with promises? The promises, what? You don't get errors when errors sometimes happen because. Uh, so, for instance, if you are within a promise, uh, like re uh, resolve handler, and an error is thrown, it's not going to make the same noise that it would if you just threw an error in some normal un promiseified application, it's, has a pos it, what it's, it's going to be treated as a rejection of that promise and something has to sort of listen to it to hear that something went wrong. We got, I mean, this, as we'll go into, we've, we've kind of set things up to give you as much information about this as possible, but it's just, there's going to be times where you're still going to be a little bit bitten by it, um, which is only going to get better. Um, Steph can probably comment on some of the changes that um, are in the works to make that information available. But the trick with promises is, um, 
really making sure that when things go wrong, you're notified about them versus them quietly failing because they're treated as this um, rejected promise that someone's got to listen to to actually know that something went wrong. Does that make sense? Cool. So, in Ember, uh, the, the particular uh, library of choice to um, handle promises and generate promises is the RSVP library. Um, there's some other popular libraries out there like Q, which I think is the one that Dominic works on, right? I think so. Dominic was the guy that spoke uh, last month. And then he was a trader and then spoke at the Angular meetup two weeks ago, which I attended with Luke. He's not a trader, he's a cool guy. <laughs> Why was I there? It's such a promising framework. And anyway, just reconnaissance. Just to know, you know where my allegiance lies. I put in too much time in this. Uh, OK, so basically, promises are cool. I don't want to go into the whole in depth about them. I'll say just a few things about them. So again, uh, if do something async uh, returns a promise versus, I don't know, a previous pattern of having to talk, pass in success handlers and event handlers directly into it, then you can make use of this dot then. Like every promise object has a dot then, um, and they all follow the pattern of a dot then takes a success handler and an error handler. And this is a really simple case, which doesn't really display why promises are all that great, but gives you an idea of how you can use them. What's cool about dot then is that you can chain these async operations together and give them a unified, one, you're getting rid of the, the nesting that happens um, normally when you have callbacks that just keep on getting more and more indented, and it's very hard to keep track of what's going on. But also, uh, if, get, if, all of these to um, sorry, if all of these methods return promises, um, then at any point, if something goes wrong, you can catch that something went wrong in this single event handler. Um, sorry, this single failure handler. So for instance, if you're going to get an authentication token and that's an async thing that's gonna take a little while, when it comes back, you can use that auth token to fetch some data and then when that data comes back, you can use that to fetch more data. Um, a lot's being expressed here and a lot of uh, kind of complex async logic is hidden from you um, even though you can make great use of it because we're using this nice promise pattern. But in what's this, what this is demonstrating is that if any of these things, get auth token, use auth token to fetch data or this, if any of these things fail, um, the way the promise chaining works is that these errors will just pass all the way through to the first error handler that you define to handle it. So if any of these things went wrong, this thing will get fired and say something went wrong. So Steph uh, showed this slide last month, which um, <laughs> made me feel like weirdly <laughs> exposed because it's a really extreme use of promises, but this is actual real code um, within the, the new router code. Um, you don't really have to know what each of these things does, but it basically guarantees a lot of the mechanics. That is, async stuff happens and transitions happen, redirects are detected, aborts are detected, and it just stops all these things from happening. And this is where um, your question was, how does this stuff get, um, these errors get uh, swallowed and potentially not displayed for you? A lot of this logic is there to um, really make this as easy as a, uh, um, sir. Right. So the question is, why do I need to? Oh, is this a, is this a real question or is this a? Um, right. <laughs> so the question is, why do I have all these error handlers? These repetitive null handle error, null handle error, null handle error. Because, uh, and one of the things I'm going to talk about in oh, this slide, I can't wait to show that one for the real first time. There's all these different hooks that you can use in a route since the facelift router. Um, which is before model. Model is the one you already knew about, which translates a URL into a request to get data from the server. And then there's after model. And all of these things are promise aware. You can return promises from them. And if any of them fail, it should stop this promise chain from continuing onward um, and continuing to call all these other hooks. So it needs to check after you know, calling before model code, did something bad happen? Was an error returned? Did this promise reject? Um, before moving onward, because if you just put it once at the end here, there'd be nothing in the way. Um, so handle error and handle abort. I'm, I'm kind of forgetting off the top of my head, but you basically need to check if like redirects have happened in the meantime and detect that and pause this promise chain from happening. Um, I can probably think of a more.
uh, that's part of it, but there's probably reasons I'm not thinking of that make this make more sense. No. Mm, I don't think so, no. Are you mad about that? <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought I detected a, like a pouty face from afar. Stupid framework. <laughs> Right, so for instance, we've got this nice syntactic sugar, which is if in before model or model or any of these things, you decide that it's time to transition elsewhere and cancel that, um, cancel that uh, the, the attempted transition. That doesn't, just, just saying this dot transition to doesn't return a rejected promise, which you could use to also halt the transition. So that's why we put in this extra architecture to check these things. After this before model hook, did the user abort? And if so, this is going to be the thing that like turns it into an error, which will get caught by handle error. This is a really complex example to really uh, dissect. I'll be happy to talk someone's ear about it, um, perhaps at the bar. But I should probably move on. So I have, again, sort of talked ahead of myself before actually getting to this lovely slide. But before model, model, and after model are these hooks that are have a lot of special meaning, both to my heart, but to RC6 and this router baseload stuff that I was working on. So, like Zoolander says, they're ridiculously, really, really ridiculously customizable. Um, so, before model, after model. By the way, these names, nobody's in love with these names. I think in probably <laughs> Ember 1.1, which is bizarrely announced at the, uh, the Ember hot seat uh, right before the one that I did, um, there might be some improvements to some of these namings. So, this has been somewhat of a conten contentious issue, but at the very least, we have these names that you can at least look at them and know immediately when they are fired and possibly what you can use these things for. Um, but you know, normally Ember tries to find these more semantic names that give a little bit more meaning to what these hooks can be used for. But quick a little aside. So remember that the model hook is the thing that's going to take something like your URL, post one, two, three, and then figure out what needs to be returned, uh, loaded from the server um, in order to eventually be, be displayed in a template. Um, well, it turns out there's a lot of logic depending on your app's use cases and uh, app flows um, where you want to be able to run some piece of logic before or possibly after this model has loaded. Um, and a good example, I mean the sort of canonical example at this point for uh, before model, you know, actually there's a lot of things you can do with before model, but the one in particular that there's an Embercast about that a lot of people were sort of frustrated by before a lot of this code, uh, this new facelift stuff came along. Um, was getting a good example for how to do client-side authentication. So for instance, if you navigate to slash articles, and articles are only supposed to be viewable by people who have logged in, you don't actually want to start loading all these articles in your model hook. You want to be able to catch it um, right as you're first attempting to enter this article's routes and say, do I, is the user even logged in? Do I have an authentication token? Um, if none of these things have happened, you know, redirect elsewhere. And that, and that particular example alone doesn't even make use of async, but because all these things are promise aware, you could also perform some async logic, which is, oh, I don't have an authentication token, try to get one, which is gonna be an async request on its own, which pauses this transition, because you were wise and returned a promise from before model. And basically, this is stuff that you would have the worst time trying to put together um, before you know, RC6 came along. Um, you know, I. Honestly, a lot of the motivation for working on this stuff was because uh, so many people were asking about this authentication um, Embercast. You know, how does all this stuff work? I always run into these problems. And when I sat down to write the code, which I kind of had an idea of what was going to really suck about doing it, um, but it surprised me um, how much it sucked. And I was embarrassed to sort of put out a screencast of kind of hacks and event handling and all these different paradigms mixing together. So instead of delivering this Embercast in a timely manner, I just spent a month fixing this stuff and getting lots of feedback from people. So this is sort of the main point of all of this. Um, please ask me any questions if the general use case behind before model and model and after model isn't clear because really cool, very powerful, even if they're not the most ideally named things in the world. I do that a lot. <laughs> I preemptively talk about the next slide. So yes, so to sort of break it down, um, and the most sort of technical details. So before model is going to be run before trying to fetch the model. Like I said, if you try to go, if you try to navigate to slash articles, you don't actually want to put in the request to the server to get those articles. I mean, maybe you've got some cool um, pattern which you've 
kind of unified, both the requesting of the articles and your authentication check or whatever. But if you want to run some logic before actually getting the thing that's going to be loaded and presented to your templates, you want to make use of the for model. Um, so you can do also lots of sync things too, like just validating that the user actually has performed some action before trying to enter this um, routes and other things too. After model, I mean, remember, we've already talked about model. It's the thing that translates URLs into um, requests to the server to load stuff. After model is going to, is a hook that runs after, uh, what it, you know, if model returns a promise, um, then, the, then the transition is basically going to pause until that data has come back from the server and the promise has successfully resolved. Um, and after model is something that is going to get called with that fully resolved uh, value. So if you request, if in your model hook you load all the articles from the server, that might return a promise but then what gets passed to after model is actually going to be your list of articles that it can work with and look through and maybe detect that, okay, there's only one article, so transition to the show route for the article versus like an index route that shows all of them. Lots of stuff that you can do with that. Question? What is typically happening with your application UI while the transition is So the question is, what happens to your application's UI while the transition is paused? Uh, right now, you can make use of this sort of global loading route, which it's not even really a route, it's more, it has the name route, but you can sort of just treat it as a handler, which is, okay, I entered at this point, so maybe like throw up a banner, throw up a loading spanner, maybe send an event on the current, uh, currently active routes to throw up whatever that current uh, route says is like an ideal sort of spinner, loading spinner to have. Um, but right now, that's what you can use, this loading route, which is your sort of global loading handler that you can use. Um, this is probably going to get a little bit more uh, love in the future because lots of people want sort of per route loading states and to be more of a first class citizen than some of the stuff that you could do with this global loading route. Um, but that's something that you can use for now. It's also worth mentioning that if, um, so the persistence library is like Ember model and Ember data. Um, for a long time they were, uh, they were, they were lost in the way that they were loading models or basically the way when you say app.post.find or something like that, you're going to get that post from the server and you're, it's going to come back to you in the form of a record array or an, a model, um, an instance of a model class. But for a long time they had, they were kind of treating these models as promises. They had dot then properties, which if the router detects the dot then property and whatever you return from any of these things, it's going to do that pausing behavior. Um, I don't know if I'm getting a little too in depth, but basically it's possible to also return things that don't pause the, um, the router transitions by just returning things that might eventually load later but don't themselves have dot thens on them because it's, uh, what do you mean by that, using bindings? Like if you just return like an empty object or something while you're waiting for the server to come back, then you can populate this empty object with your dot yes. and it wouldn't be a promise so the router could keep track. Right, so you could return some object which gets its values later but it itself isn't going to pause this router transition because it's not a promise itself. So what I, I guess what my main point was that it was a kind of weird that these Ember models um, had were, were sort of treat, were being treated as promises because it's kind of weird to mix the idea of this you know this final entity with a promise that represents this one time attempt to load it. It's it made things really messy and also kind of got in the way of this pattern of letting you choose whether you want these transitions to pause or not. Um, so where was it? So in any of these hooks, you can call, you can redirect elsewhere by calling transition to, um, and it'll just work. It'll just cancel the existing transition and go elsewhere. And as I've sort of made the belabored this point, if you return a promise from any of these hooks, that's going to be the thing that um, pauses these transitions and doesn't continue onward until um, the async operation has finished. So I've, I've been on this sort of router facelift tour. I was uh, in. Chicago last week and Boston before that and uh, Matthew Beal, I don't know if he's here. Matt, are you here? No? He's been wanting me to sort of talk about this stuff and it never seemed to make it into the presentation. But you're getting this today, a little snippet of it. Um, the form model I think is probably the most powerful of these new things that are added, um, these new hooks that are added. And this by no means is like the official answer, the robust solution to the problem of uh, async code loading versus presenting everything up front um, when you first load the app. But this just gives you an idea. I mean, what I, what I want to do by showing this slide is give people some ideas for how they can make use of these nice primitives with the router and pausing transitions to 
come up with some nice patterns for how you want to do this. But for instance, if you had a post route that um, had you manipulate post objects and display post objects, you could feasibly not even, when you first load your application, you could feasibly not even provide the code for the app.post model. And you could wait until you've actually navigated to post slash one, two, three, for instance, to actually load the code associated with the app.post model. So because we're using dot get script here, this is just an Ajax, um, sorry, this is just a jQuery function which returns a promise. Um, we can just make a simple check in here which says, does app post exist? If it does not exist, then return a promise that will load all the model code associated with, with post. I mean, again, pretty messy. It doesn't really handle more complex cases when perhaps there's lots of other different things that depend on other models that need to load. But this just basically gives you an idea. This would have been really tricky to do in the past, but this will just work. Your transition will pause when you try to go to post slash one, two, three, and it'll only continue when it's actually loaded the code associated with um, that post model. So again, more robust solutions are possible, but based on the basic premise of this example. So go forth and discover some new awesome things because um, you are suddenly now able to do that. So we all talked about what happens. So these, promise, these promises, while they're waiting to be resolved, uh, will pause the transition. The transition will continue. You won't start rendering all these new templates until you've actually gotten all the data that you need to come back from these promises. But what happens when a promise is rejected? What happens when you try to load some resource that you don't have access to because you haven't logged in yet? What happens if you, there was never a resource there anyway? So in the past, there was always this events hash, which I talked about earlier. But there were never any sort of reserve event names that, um, that, that Ember itself knows about. But that's sort of changed since RC6. So there's these two event names that um, Ember will actually fire for you that if you want to define some more custom error handling behavior, this is one of them that you would want to make use of. And that is just the error event. So the error event is going to fire on a route where a promise was rejected or an error was thrown through you know, model before model or after model. And like all events, it's going to bubble like upward from that route. So if this example below has post route and inside its model hook, which is the thing that gets the data to eventually be presented in the template, if you try to load something from a, from a URL that doesn't exist, that's obviously going to fail. This is going to return a promise, but it's going to fail pretty immediately. And when it does, it's going to fire this error event, which is going to pass both the reason for the failure or the exception thrown, and also this transition attempt. And this is a nice thing to have available to you. This represents basically this this represents the, the transition attempt into this failed uh, or failed to load route. Um, so, for instance, I think this is probably not the ideal example of how to do this, but you could, for instance, display some banner, or you could check to see. You know, is the reason that it failed because of a 401? Or were we unauthorized? Did we not have access to see this piece of data? And if that's the case, then we say, okay, let's transition to login because clearly once the user logs in, they'll be able to see this information. Otherwise, let's just say this route doesn't know how to handle this error, so as someone was asking before, we can just bubble this upward by saying return true. Um, any questions about this? Yeah? The transition object is a representation of a transition into this route. So if you were on uh, the contact route and then you navigated to post slash one, two, three or whatever, transition would represent that transition attempt. It has some information about where you're trying to go, what models have been resolved in the course of that transition, and as I'll show in just a second, it's got some neat facilities for, you can say transition.abort, and you can say transition.retry later, which I'll show you a cool example of. Um, there, was there another question? I think someone, yeah. So the question is, uh, will invalid requests from Ember data fire as error events in here? Um, I'm not actually sure. I'm guessing they probably do. Do you know, Steph? Yeah. So if it's a, if it's a, I don't really, I, I know that Ember model, for instance, is sort of the, alternative to Ember data, a little simpler alternative, but a lot of people are using it. That's, that's done the, the thing that I was talking about earlier. That's actually split out the, the, the dot then property that make, makes models promises from elsewhere. But if what you are returning um, from model or from any of these hooks is a promise, and that promise is from Ember data and it fails, then I believe, yeah, this should still just fire the event, or the, the error event. Um, it's really, I mean, the, the logic for when this fires is, is pretty simple. If what you return from one of these hooks 
is a promise, and the promise fails, fire an error event. So, um, but I'm, I'm not really the Ember data expert, so I don't know if there's exceptions to that rule of when they use promises or not. Um, yeah. Question is, is there a timeout on these transitions? Um, no, because maybe we could have one, but basically we're, I, right now we're, we're pretty much one-to-one -one with, uh, with the general promises spec, and promises I don't think define a, a, a timeout. Is that true? Yeah, so there's nothing in the promises specs that are most popular that define a timeout. Right, but if you don't go out of your way to sort of put in a, a, a timeout, um, that will reject this deferred object with well, the promises. Don't prevent you from doing that. Yeah. They facilitate it if you want to actually do it. Right. Um, Make sense? Cool. Anything else before moving on? We're probably about three slides away for what it's worth. Um, so the other transition, uh, sorry, the other event name, which is sort of a reserved event name in Ember, um, is this will transition. This is getting a little bit away from. Um, you know, all this async stuff, which was like the, the core focus, but will transition is something that will fire uh, at the beginning of any transition attempt. Um, another one of the things that was really difficult to handle um, in previous iterations of the router was, you know, say for instance, you're on some route that's got a bunch of forms and as you type stuff in, if the user accidentally bumps, you know, the back button, you don't want to just nuke all that data and forget it. I mean, there's ways that you could remember it, but it's still kind of annoying that the transition um, happen in the first place if there's kind of some stuff on the page that you want the user to make absolutely sure they're fine with getting rid of. So this will transition is um, a good place to put that sort of thing. It's going to fire for any kind of transition attempt, whether it's a sort of like a manual transition to from fired from one of your event handlers uh, in your code, or if it's one coming from when you like try to change the URL, navigate backwards. Um, so yeah, this quick example here says, ask the controller, you know, can I navigate? And this, I don't know why this is changing the fonts on me. That's a pretty cool effect. Um, but the, uh, the, con the controller can basically decide, no, you shouldn't really be like, navigating away at this point, at which point the, man, this is getting pretty messed up. There we go. Um, at which point the, the route can say, okay, uh, this transition should happen. And someone was asking before, what is this transition object that gets passed? In? Well, on different handler, but uh, the will transition um, handler also gets this transition object, and it can say transition out abort, stop this thing from happening, and then you know alert some clever dumb little pun. Um, and the last really cool feature, which is the ability to retry a previously failed transition. So we've got all these examples of authentication that we keep on talking about, and this will show up in the um, the, the the demo to sort of review some of this stuff, but. Um, if a transition fails because, I don't know, a 401 error, and then you redirected the user to log in, and they did that, it's nice to be able to say, take this previous transition attempt and retry it, because otherwise there's not really a good way of bookkeeping where the user tried to go. If you have a reference to this transition object and you can just call retry on it, you don't really need to think much harder about it than that, and it'll just work. Um, and those are kind of the main methods that you might ever call on this transition object. There's some other things, uh, other state that's stored on it, and you can poke around if you're interested. Um, but pretty much it's just abort and retry are going to be your most popular ones. So, quick demo. A lot of this is similar. I've tweaked this example a little bit from, from last month, but it's, it's worth sort of talking about this again since I only had so much time to talk about it uh, last time. But just let me go over what this is actually doing. So if you've got this app sketched out to have your index route, your FAQ, your photos, articles, and login, um, and you've got articles and photos um, thanks, uh, as authenticated routes that should be able to, basically you should be able to see articles or photos until you've logged in. Then the way this app works is you can freely go between home and FAQ, but when you go to articles it's going to say you must log in because you know, this user hasn't tried to log in yet. Um, if I type in some fields and I try to click away, it's got that new feature that I was telling you about, which is it stops you from going anywhere. It says, where do you think you're going? But if you actually log in, it says you are logged in, and it is going to rerun that transition attempt to go back to the articles route, which is where I originally tried to go before getting redirected to login. Um, you know, just to verify that that's actually working, if I try to go to photos route and then log in, it's smart enough to go back to the photos route as well, which has some goofy little photoshops. I don't even remember if I used this from last time, but... 
you all know who, the, who this is? What's, what's going on here? Usually when Luke makes a presentation, it starts off with some photos of him doing volleyball, but pretty much on my free time, I'm like Photoshopping when I'm not coding Ember, much to their annoyance. So anyways, let me just talk a little bit about how all this actually works, because this covers a lot of the different things at play. Um, a lot of it which is kind of sim simulated and a little fake, but again, here's this router DSL, which is super simple. Sketch out all the different apps or uh, routes that are going to be in your app. And then I've gone ahead for, for, for the most part, I'm not even really overriding any of these views and controllers and routes that are generated, but only the ones that I actually need to customize in a certain way. So for instance, I have articles routes and photos routes um, that both have their model hooks set up to just kind of retrieve, kind of fake retrieve uh, these images from a you know, non-existent stubbed out server. But they extend from this app.authenticated route. And that's where a lot of this logic for clicking on a route and then getting redirected elsewhere comes in because in this parent route, authenticated route, I've defined this before model. And what this guy does is ask the login controller, um, has a user logged in? And if not, print a message, um, take this transition object, this transition attempt, and save it for later so that we can remember it after the user actually logs in and retry it. And then we are going to transition to log, log in. So that's exactly what happens when we click articles. You must log in. And behind the scenes, it saves that transition, and here I am in this login route. So down here, remember there was a thing where if I fill out half these forms and I click away, it says, where do you think you're going? And this isn't so much the async stuff again, but this is making use of this will transition event, which gets past a transition. This guy asks the controller, um, can the user navigate? Can the user navigate away? And all this is, this is just a computed property, this checks to make sure that the user hasn't logged in or whether the form has data. Um, not so important to go into detail about that, but if the user cannot navigate, then we'll say transition abort, prevent this thing from happening, and print out this little message that just says, you know, where do you think you're going? When I actually click login to simulate this sort of fake login, that's going to fire this here, which is an example of me having an event handler on the controller versus, you know, within the route. Um, you know, lots, a lot of times the pattern makes more sense to put in the uh, login route if you're going the full sort of state machine way, but I guess in this case it sort of makes sense to have in the controller. But we're going to say you are logged in, we are going to remember that we have logged in, so the next time we try to navigate to articles route, it's not going to stop and you know, redirect us back to login. And we are going to take this previous transition, which we stored on the login controller all the way up here in this authenticated routes before model, or we're going to grab this transition and say retry, which is how when you click login, and you log in, it knows to go back to articles in the same way, or if you do it with photos, and you log in, you wind up back at photos. So this is a quick demo that really goes over all of the different things. I guess what's missing from here is that there's not actually anything we're doing with promises, but for instance, uh, if we wanted to spice up this exa example, we could return, I don't know, some promise from here that takes two seconds of time arbitrarily before throwing error, and it would all basically work the same way, though I guess at that point we'd have to use this error event. Anyway, um, I think we're, this has been a reasonably long enough presentation. I'd be happy to play with this example a little bit if people have some questions about the basic concepts, but for the most part, I think we are, um, that, that covers most of the stuff. Um, are there any questions about these examples, and perhaps how I could change a few minor, minor things to tweak this? Yeah. Um, so what are some resources to get more familiar with uh, promises because they're not, they don't really show up all too, too often in, um, in, in some of the Ember documentation. Yeah, I mean, it, for, it is definitely more of an advanced uh, feature. And a lot watch, of the, watch the video from last month's meetup. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, Dominic DeNicola's website, good resource. Um, 
but beyond that, I guess once you're comfortable with that, um, I, I would say definitely I have a slide which, um, actually wait, I'm trying to think. Let me go back to this real quick. Not the Boston meetup, that's not correct. All right, anyway, I, um, let me just move on to this last slide. Um, the, the authentication, so this Embercast that I was talking about was the one that sort of drove a lot of the development of this new stuff. Um, i trying to remember, does it, yeah, so it, it doesn't like create a promise itself, but it makes use of jQuery's, um, uh, one of jQuery's functions which uh, does actually return a promise. So that's an example of making use of it and sort of kicking in some of this async logic. Um, so that'll give you an example that kind of reiterates a lot of what I'm talking about today. But I guess in general, definitely look at the last month's presentation and a lot of stuff that Dominic has been doing and that'll give you a good idea of some of these patterns. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to post these slides uh, later. There's a lot of different um, examples of what you can do with the new async router stuff. Um, Beyond this, I just want to say that uh, you know a lot of this work was a lot of stuff that I did, but it was a very collaborative effort, particularly working with Luke and working with a lot of other people um, that had some ideas. Because I, I basically posted how the progress of these new ideas were coming on the Ember discourse, which is discussed at Ember.js. It's a forum that's written in Ember. You should, um, definitely check it out because you might get a little bit of a sneak preview at some planned features in the future and might be able to voice your opinions of why you think this thing is cool and um, why you prefer the API to do this instead, but there was a lot of discussion about how this stuff should work on the Ember discourse, so got a lot of help through that, and yeah, beyond that, check out the authentic uh, authentication part two on Embercast, because it talks about a lot of what we did today. So that's it for me. Um, please let me know. Do you have any questions? Cool. Hey, thank you all for coming. Um, I want to personally invite you out for a drink tonight. Um, I'm not buying, but I want to invite you out. Uh, we're going to go to Linen Hall on 3rd Avenue. It's 101 3rd Avenue between 12th and 13th. Um, so if you'd like to join us for some Ember chatter and uh, a, a beverage, you're more than welcome. Um, thanks again to all of our speakers. Steph has a quick announcement. Um, for people that have Ember apps in production, we just released a security patch. The surprising thing, there's a security vulnerability in Ember, and chances are it affects absolutely no one here. But if you allow user content to be bound to a tag name, they can get past the XX, XSS, the cross-site scripting protection that we have in. So we just released a patch a few minutes ago. So, just so you know, since you're here, may as well find out. You heard it here first. All right, thanks everybody. Hope to see some of you at the Hacker Hours um, at the meetup next month on the 22nd, and a lot of you for a beer right now.